panel. And if you, if you weren't on the first one earlier today, then we got another great one here on, you know, how to get a job, something Bill has moderated for literally decades at this point, And he worked to get a number of folks from different walks of journalism life from print and digital and broadcast and video and social. Uh, I'm Chris Vaccaro. I'm the SPJ Region 1 coordinator and helped put this together with Bill. So just really grateful that you're all here, uh, both the, the panelists and, and the people uh, hoping to be educated and informed today. And then, uh, you know, there's a bunch of other things between the rest of today and tomorrow. So hopefully most of you will, will be able to join those, including the, um, the trivia social hour session fun at 4.30 uh, with Lou Harry from SPJ and Colin from the Deadline Club. Um, thanks to Bill again for moderating this uh, longtime Newsday reporter author of so many books on local Long Island history now, and uh, has helped edit literally thousands of resumes and cover letters uh, over his career. And we'll, we'll continue to do that until, uh, until he's not here anymore in another you know, 30 or 40 years, hopefully. Um, and uh, mute if you're not talking, use the chat if you have any questions, comments, concerns, things that you wanna talk about. Use uh, SPJR1C as a hashtag if you wanna keep the combo going on social. And that's it. So, you know, thanks again to everybody who uh, is here and um, I'll mute and uh, let you guys kick it off. Okay, thank you, Chris. Uh, th thanks to the panel and uh, those who tuned in. So let me do a quick, uh, Chris covered me pretty much. Uh, I had 33 years at Newsday, six years from at Gannett before that as reporter and editor. And uh, basically, and I left Newsday in 2014, primarily to write Long Island history books and the, uh, Fifth one is coming out on the uh, called Perspiring, George Washington Perspiring in May. Um, but the main reason I do this is because I've done recruiting in the past for Newsday and Gannett and uh, learned uh, the hard way as a job applicant what to do and what not to do. So I figured it'd be nice to share that. So I've done a lot of these and pulled in a, a lot of recruiters from other papers, try to get a consensus of what makes sense. Some of it uh, is, uh, is disputed and we'll probably have some of that today, but uh, Basically, this will be a lot of how-to advice for, uh, for people that are looking for jobs. So uh, our panelists in, in alphabetical order are Aaron Geismer, who's a, a former reporter and editor at Newsday and a sailing friend of mine, uh, now managing editor uh, of the New York uh, Post for overseeing the website. Uh, Nancy Hahn, uh, executive vice president of news at Now This, the leading socially distributed news brand. Previously, she was a senior producer at CBS News and executive producer at ABC News. And she's also taught for five years as an adjunct professor at our alma mater, uh, NYU. Uh, Bernice Carney is the news director of KSAT 12 News in San Antonio, Texas, um, and comes to us thanks to Zoom. Uh, she's worked in local news for more than 30 years and has been news director for the station since 2013. Uh, Calvin is a former colleague at Newsday. Uh, is Director of Community Affairs and Newsroom Development at the paper. Previously worked for ABC News as a digital news editor and uh, <clears throat> has worked for uh, multiple other pu publications, including the Miami Herald, the, the Atlanta Con Journal Constitution, the Ann Arbor News and USA Today. And then uh, Kate Napolinski is a multimedia journalist from Long Island who graduated from Ithaca College in 2018, has worked as a staff reporter for the Times Review Media Group out on the North Fork of Long Island, and is now associate editor for the Long Island Advance on the South Shore of Long Island, where she manages digital content and social media for five online publications. So um, let's just start out with um, what's the job market? I mean, everybody knows the news media industry is contracting uh, there are new uh, new initiatives starting up, but uh, what, what's the market like? Uh, what, what do you see in your fields? Um, and, and just jump in, anybody with, with, with any comments? Uh, Calvin, you want to start? And you're muted. Uh, sure. You know, one of the difficult things about a conversation like this is is that I always want to be be honest and encouraging at the same time. Uh, the, these are, it's tough to do that these days. I mean, these are really challenging times as, as Bill points out. Um, uh, the market is shrinking, no doubt about it. There, there are, however, and this is a bright spot, that there are, however, opportunities uh, still available. Um, 
it takes a, a clear understanding though, I think of, of, of what, what, what you want, what, what your strengths are, what, what you're interested in. And you have to uh, learn to match that with the jobs that, uh, that are, are out there. Um, I think the market probably, at least in, in our area, is probably gonna be shrinking for some time. Uh, we, we have not made any real hires, um, partly because of the pandemic, but, but also uh, partly because, again, just the nature of the business right now. We, we've not made any hires in, in the past year. Um, we are marginally more optimistic going forward. Um, you know, some, some of the advertising in, in, in the business is bouncing back. Um, you know, uh, uh, the vaccine is, is, is out there, people are healthier, uh, the economy is, is coming back. So again, I mean, I, I would say cautiously optimistic uh, market-wise at this point. Okay, what about TV? Um, Bernice, you wanna take a crack at that one? Um, we, we're actually doing quite a bit of hiring and not just at my station, but I think a, a number of, of stations, depending on their market, where they are in the country, uh, you know the the Texas Texas market is still booming because we've got a lot of people who are moving into the state from other parts of the country. So as we see population growth, we see growth opportunities in our uh, media offerings, whether it's on the side of broadcast or the side of digital or social. So. Um, so I'm very fortunate that my, um, my staff has actually grown over the last couple, three years, um, and I've been able to add positions as we've looked at different opportunities. And, you know, the, the thing about local news, uh, particularly local broadcast, is people, especially since the pandemic, uh, people are really thirsting for local information and really they are gravitating toward those those platforms and those brands that are providing a lot of local coverage of the pandemic and the the things that have come because of the pandemic so the, the economic looking for jobs looking for the shots looking for testing or whatever the case may be as the cycle has has gone on so we have really doubled down on what we offer in terms of local content and context uh, for our viewers and our readers and our social media followers. Okay, uh, Nancy. Hi, yeah, um, we've seen many of our competitors and the industry in general making several you know, job cuts, layoffs. We see that all the time in this field. However, that doesn't mean it's um, hopeless for anyone going into journalism, especially um, whether it's television or online or print. Um, so in our situation, we actually have several really key, amazing jobs open. Um, it's just coincidentally that they're open as you are asking me to speak on this panel. But um, it's a sign of oftentimes when you do sort of um, you know, truncate your staff. There's a there's always some sort of um, a strategic you know rethinking of how the position should be lined up. Oftentimes, there are new projects that come in, and so we need not only freelance help but also new newer staff positions. And so some of the openings are due to various um, you know employees who have left the company for other opportunities so therefore those those positions are replenished by new by new openings or sometimes as in our case there's a re-strategizing of where we need you know whether it's leadership or support from a junior level producer and and that has created some opportunities as well but it's no secret that yes it's shrinking in many different areas in this industry but that doesn't mean that <clears throat> That doesn't mean that there aren't opportunities also. So it's the same um, sentiment as, as Calvin, who, hi Calvin, we used to work together. So nice to see you after all these years. Um, but it's, but it, yes, there's optimism, but you just have to be even more diligent about how you look, making sure that you're not spinning your wheels um, with, with postings that may or may not suit your, your specific skill set. And I'm sure we'll get more into that. Um, 
as we go on in this panel. Okay. Um, Aaron, what about digital? Yeah, I mean, I would echo a lot of what was just said um, by Nancy. I think uh, personally, I do, I have positions open right now um, and a few more to come. And I think with, I think there has been sort of a rejiggering of roles and a, a reevaluation of the kind of business model. Um, who do we have? What do they excel at? Which roles are they good at? And then I think we found that that has opened, been able to let us open up some new opportunities for people where we realized we were kind of missing things. Um, so I think that is a product of this year. You know, we unfortunately did have layoffs last year. Um, and then I think as, as, as business has kind of come back around, uh, we found we've been able to open up more positions just recently. Great. Um, so Kate, let me, let's bring you into this since uh, you, you're probably the most recent person on the, uh, here that's had to go through this uh, hiring uh, hoops. Um, what, what's your experience and what yeah, are people yeah, looking so for? Yeah, so I can really only, you know, speak personally. I was furloughed back in, in March during the pandemic um, and kind of going off of what everyone just said, you know, I really had to pivot to make myself um, marketable to local businesses that were more geared toward pandemic related content. I was more of just like a print, um, like pretty straightforward staff reporter um, when I was working on the North Fork. Um, but I really had to gear myself more toward video actually. Um, and I wouldn't have gotten my current role um, if it weren't for that, just cause that's what they were looking for. That's what they really needed. Um, right now during the pandemic. And I think that um, one of the things, and, and I'm sure you know, we'll get into this as we keep going, but you just really need to be very versatile, especially right now. I think it's like so crucial um, so that you can fit into any of those kind of roles that are ever changing, especially um, right now, so. Okay. Um, so where, where should people look? What, what do you recommend as a place to actually, uh, you know, other than, uh, doing what I did, which is apply, you know, directly to every media organization that interested me. Uh, what, what kind of uh, places do you send people looking for jobs? Yeah, yeah. Well, I think that one of the things that I always recommend is go toward who you know, and kind of like, if you have any kind of people that you can reach out to that are, you know, either, you know, from J school or mentors or, you um, people that you've worked with in a professional environment, I think those are the people that you need to reach out to and kind of go that direction because they have the most experience. They can really give you, they can really guide you. I mean, also like side note, Bill has really been like my number one mentor throughout this entire process um, since I graduated in 20, 2018. Um, so thanks, Bill. But um, having a person that you can turn to, um, you know, just in the industry is really key, I think, to find openings and position it. And, and again, like I said before, you, you really need to be um, versatile. You, you can't just say, you know, I'm print, I'm only focusing on print. I think you need to be, I can be in front of a camera, I can do copy, you know, I can do video. Um, at least I feel like that's what people are looking for in the industry now. Okay. What about the other Bill, panelists? Bill, can I just jump in there? And I would just yep. second what, what, what Kate has said, actually on two points. One is that I've, I've done lots of uh, job, job fairs and, and recruitment events. And it's always amazing to me, even disappointing that a lot of the kids, I mean, I'll say, hey, um, stay in touch. I, I like to keep track of, you, of, of, of what you're working on. Uh, I may have some opportunities down the line. And I would say of, of, of every 10 people, maybe one or two actually follow up. And, and that's an easy, easy request. I mean, I, it seems simple enough to me. So it, it's, a, it's, it's sort of a wasted opportunity. Again, when people offer their, their assistance, their, their expertise, it's crazy not to take advantage of that. Um, and I see it um, more than I should, more than we should. And, and then just on the other point, uh, I think Kate is also right. I guess I look back at my newspaper career and it was always pretty linear, you know, reporter, editor, uh, and you just kind of went straight, straight along a particular path that that really doesn't doesn't work as much anymore, if ever. Um, 
I think careers now need, need to zigzag. Uh, I mean, you can still zigzag in an upward uh, a trajectory, but again, you're gonna do things that, that you never maybe even imagine doing uh, as you step out and see uh, what's available. So be prepared for, for any and all opportunities. Yeah, no, I've, I've seen the same thing, but I think, I don't know if it's uh, where people don't take advantage of the opportunity, they just don't seem to focus, you know, because I, I had to make all my own breaks. And I, you know, when I work with students in particular, I'll say, well, if, you know, stay in touch if you want help with your resume. You know, I have a whole sort of network now with of internship opportunities and stuff. And I'm always amazed how few people take me up on it, you know, and, but those are the people that make, you know, make it really because they're focused. Um, so uh, Nancy or Aaron or uh, Bernice, where, where, do you, where do you tell people to go look for jobs? Any, uh, any websites in particular? Or... I think a lot of like the, oh, sorry, uh, the, the traditional sites like, you know, journalism jobs. Um, indeed, I get a lot of like, see a lot of interesting things there and uh, like Medio Bistro. But um, I think the key there is like kind of taking, going from that step to like kind of what Kate mentioned, which is, if you see a job on like journalism jobs that you like, I think, yes, apply through the normal channels, but then like go to your LinkedIn and type in the name of the brand and see, you know, who you know, or who you're connected to even through like third or fourth connections um, at that company and see if somebody could make like an introduction for you or just say, hey, heads up, I know somebody who just applied through journalism jobs or through your HR website. Um, so that it's not just like a, a, a blind application and that somebody's kind of looking out for you and mentioning your name. Yeah, it's definitely who you know helps. Uh, anybody else have any sites they like to direct job seekers to? Uh, the, the only difference um, in terms of site is I always say to kind of hone in on the places or the brands that you feel strongly about and, and want to pursue and just go directly to their site first to see if there's anything and then do the reverse uh, engineering of trying to figure out if you know someone. But some of this also goes back to um, internships and relationship building and too many times. And I've had mentor mentees who same thing, it, it was on them. The burden was on the mentee to reach out in this particular program I was in. The mentees were told it's on you to do all the reach out because it was a training of how you foster relationships with people and so often the mentees, my mentees would just kind of fall off and, and never be heard from again. And I always thought that that was such a wasted opportunity because we often uh, you know, know about openings that are coming up before anybody else, before it actually gets posted. Um, and so to lose those connections is a really big, um, you know, it's a shame and it, and it slows you down. It will ultimately slow you down because when you talk to anyone in this industry and you find out their stories of how each one of us got specific jobs or kind of moved um, around from company to company. Often it's some, some sort of offhand relationship or you knew someone who kind of put your resume in front of somebody else. And, you know, there's that whole tree of, of people who got involved, <laughs> who may have been involved, but rarely do you find people say, oh yeah, I just blindly sent my resume and somebody got back to me. It never, it never happens. Well, I remember when I graduated from school, I sent, I sent out 275 job applications, heard from 50 that were rejections and the others didn't bother. So, you know, going, going in cold is always difficult. Bernice, you had something? Yeah, I was just, I, I think echoing, um, you, you know, what, what the Nancy and Calvin and Aaron said, it was, it's a, it's, it is about relationships. It is about uh, not losing the email addresses or phone numbers or whatever of people who you meet, whether, I mean, I do a lot of job, uh, job fairs, career fairs for um, different journalism organizations. So Na uh, NAHJ, National Association of Hispanic Journalists, National Association of Black Journalists, SPJ, RTDNA, because I, A, a I do a lot of hiring. I mean, I, I hire for our, our station, but I also just like to meet people and see who's out there. And one of the things that I really enjoy is connecting people to other opportunities, whether it's in my station or at one of our sister stations or somebody I know in the business who's looking for someone. I like to 
be sort of a, a, a sidebar, um, like side hustle recruiter, because I think that that's important. And so I like meeting people and then I have different files that I just kind of hold on to in the, in the event that I know of a position that's open or I have a position open or one of my colleagues at the other stations uh, in our group has something available. Um, because you never know when that good karma is going to come back to you. Um, so, so that's, you know, I, I always look at, at, you know, like I've looked at different y'all's different um, websites because I'm like, oh, I wonder what they have open. You never know. And it's not that I'm necessarily looking, but I always like to know what other people are looking for and, and even how they advertise and recruit for those different positions. So. And also, okay. just to follow on, on Bernice's point there, and I won't speak for her, but 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 it helps um, to to get to know people like like Bernice because I mean, say you've had a few conversations with her, she she could actually speak on your behalf. I mean, she she might ha have never worked with you, but she could say, "Hey, I've had some really uh, deep and and important conversations with uh, with this person." And, and I think you you might benefit from having that that same kind of conversation just to begin. Yep, for sure, for sure. Um, one one place that you can look is um, editor and publisher, which is used to be you know the magazine you'd look at. Now it's online, but I, I posted the web address on the chat. Uh, I mean, my experience with the, with those kind of mass gathering things was always it was like a running joke by the time you apply the job had been filled three months ago uh, and the, the best running joke was when i was in college there was an opening in, in enp for a reporting job in clovis new mexico and everybody on my college paper applied and you know nobody ever heard anything so we assumed that they filled it but um, there you know there are sites that list them and um, there are jobs i know the the former colleague at Newsday is now down in the uh, Charleston newspaper in South Carolina, and, and there have been a, a lot of hiring down there. Um, so there are jobs out there. Uh, so let's talk about qualifications. Uh, those of you involved in hiring, what, what what are you looking for in an applicant? Bernice, you're up. You want to might as well keep going. Uh, okay. Well, for me, I am looking for most most of my positions are on camera positions, but what I'm looking for are people who to Kate's earlier point are nimble and have multiple uh, talents that they're going to be able to put to bear for our, for our station, for our company. So they're, they're not uh, merely people who know how to put together a broadcast story and know how to do a live shot or, or whatever, but they're also, uh, they're good at digital copy, they're good at uh, maybe video editing, they're good at social media outreach, you know, they're, they're sort of triple and quadruple threats in terms of their skill set, because very few TV stations are just hiring TV reporters anymore. You're hiring multimedia journalists, whether they have to shoot their own stories all the time or not, they still have to have the capabilities um, you know, that come with digital storytelling as well as broadcast storytelling. Obviously, it should be obvious that you have to have good writing skills. You have to have good news judgment. Um, you have to be a good person. You, I, I'm looking for people who are going to be good teammates, not just good being themselves, but helpful to others on our team and who can serve as mentors to other younger journalists as they come into the building, either as interns or trainees or whatever. So uh, I'm looking for a good human being who's, who's, um, who's got a lot of skills in their, in their back pockets. Um, and this, this is for you and everybody else. I mean, um, in terms of checking off checklists, uh, you want, do you want to see campus journalism, uh, journalism classes, uh, oh, internships, freelance? I do like, well, I'm typically not hiring people right out of college unless they're my producer trainees. And a lot of those are people who worked for their, their uh, campus TV stations or campus um, newspapers or online uh, products and may have done at least one or two TV internships, so they have been exposed to newscast producers and really have honed in on that as a as an opportunity to 
you know, go down a career path. Um, I, so reporters and photographers typically are, you know, at least three years of experience so that when I'm seeing their applications or their resumes, they've got a reel that is updated with working journalism from the position that they currently hold. Um, so that, that's what I'm looking for. And I'm not looking for just the sizzle reel of my latest and greatest when I went and covered the hurricane seven months ago or covered a fire three years ago or whatever. I'm looking for, what did you do yesterday? Okay. Um, so almost without fail, whenever I start talking to somebody, I, I have them send me the last five stories that they did and they have to have digital copy to back that up. All right, we'll get, we're gonna come back to that. Um, um, anybody else, uh, what, what are you looking for uh, both you know, credentials and experience for, for, um, for somebody who, who could get hired? Calvin? The thing that I see oh, a lot yeah, um, is that I'm, since I'm usually hiring for our, our news department, um, but I do get a lot of resumes from people who don't have news experience, who have worked in other digital fields. And this, this might be an error on the part of our like job descriptions, um, if they're not clear enough or they're getting into the wrong places. But um, I think just because it's a digital job, sometimes people um, apply that don't have news experience thinking, well, I've worked in features on websites and I've worked in sports. Um, and so I would say that, you know, if, if you want to be in news, get some news experience and highlight, find a way to highlight that on your resume, even if it's just a little bit ex of experience, like break that out for me to easily see. Because if it doesn't look like you've done a news job before, I hesitate to even do the interview um, because I do get a lot of candidates and I am looking for somebody who I, I know has some proven news judgment. Okay. Um, Calvin, Nancy? The same. Um, really, this just speaks to kind of doing your homework before you apply to make sure that, you know, people are spending a lot of time being very specific about the requirements and also what the job function is. So if you need to have really sharp writing skills and or video editing skills, you know, we're using Premiere daily. Um, and if you've never touched Premiere, then chances are it's not going to work out. So really just focusing in because part of the issue is that, and I'm sure many people have experienced this, once a job posting goes out, there are sometimes hundreds if not thousands of resumes that flood your internal job board um, software. And so what the recruiter will end up doing is before even I see who the applicants are, because we, you know, and last year, a couple of years ago, we posted a PA position, which is a job that's like for people right out of school, there was more than 1200 applicants. So clearly nobody is actually physically going through those resumes, but they're searching up specific keywords to, to make sure that the skills match the description of the job. So um, that speaks to a whole other section of this conversation, which is about the resume. But um, just Coming making next. sure that, you know, know who you're applying to and sort of, if you don't have that level of skills that you know are required based on the posting, it's probably not going to work in your favor. Okay, Calvin, anything? Well, those folks have, have pretty much covered um, uh, the waterfront there. The only thing I would, would, would just kind of talk about for a second is, is a particular soft skill, I guess, or softer skill, and that is, is curiosity. Um, I think uh, it, 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 it's disappointing to me when I speak to candidates um, who don't have any questions about anything, questions about our organization, I don't know, questions about what's going on in the world. Uh, that that is a is someone that I'm probably not going to follow up with. Um, so again, you need to be curious about uh, uh, what's going on, not not just with the company, but, but but broadly speaking, because that's what we do. I mean, if you're not curious, then then you really don't make for a good journalist. Uh, okay. Um, the way the way I describe this, you know, when I'm either mentoring somebody one on one or I'm doing one of my job. Uh, career things is, um, you know, it's like, look at the step of the ladder. And as soon as you climb one step, everybody else that hasn't climbed that same step, you have an advantage. You know, I remember, you know, like, uh, you know, in some of the intern programs, it's like, 
uh, people that come in and they, you know, for interviews and things, they say, well, you know, I was, I was a journalism major in college, uh, or maybe I worked for the campus media outlet. And I said, yeah, and? Uh, and they said, what do you mean? I said, well, have you done internships? Have you done freelance? And, you know, the people get sort of this myopic view of the world, like if they're a big, big deal on campus, that's all they need. And I said, yeah, but you're competing with the big person, big man or big woman on campus like you from thousands of colleges around the country. So you need to stand out. Uh, you need to have internships, you need to freelance and, uh, you know, work your way up. And the minute you hit one of that next steps and everything you did before is sort of obvious and not required. So, um, you know, that's when, when I'm working with people, I'm saying, okay, where, where's your campus journalism? Great. Where's your class is great. But if you haven't done interims, you haven't done some freelance work, you're really chasing the crowd. So um, just something, you know, while people are still in school, they need to be working at that. Uh, okay, uh, um, we're going to talk about resumes next. Does anybody out in the uh, from the group in the audience have any questions about what we've said so far? Uh, let's just see if there's anything. In the, uh, there was a few things in the chat already. Can I just respond to yes a comment in the chat that I see. Yeah, sure, go ahead. Um, so Krista said career coaches always talk about transferable skills and tell candidates to apply anyway. Good to hear when that works and when it doesn't. And I think that was in response um, to both Nancy and I. And I just want to add to that, like. You should apply, you should apply. Like if a job is interesting to you and you're not quite sure if you're at the level that they're looking for, we might've written the job description wrong um, or you don't know like what other candidates we're gonna get. I would apply. I think the difference is like, do you really want this job or you do you just want a job? Because if you just want a job, like we can tell the difference and that's kind of a waste of everyone's time. But if you really want this job and you think that the skills that you have, this feels like the next natural step for you, and you can also apply what you've learned and show me that how you could apply what you've learned in your current role and your past roles to what I'm asking for in this role. That's still like perfectly okay. And I think that we can have a great conversation and that's a good place to start. Okay, there's a question about uh, guidance for specialists. Um, I mean, generally what happens, if, especially if you're new into the profession is you're not gonna be a specialist. Uh, you know, people say, I wanna be a theater critic. I wanna be a sports reporter. Uh, or you know, a news anchor on TV, and usually the entry level jobs are much more general than that. You have to sort of you know pay your dues. Um, I mean, I was always interested in arts writing, but I, my first daily job I was a, a beat, town beat reporter. But the paper said you know on, when when with downtime you can do music reviews or whatever music features. So I did that. Um, but uh, you know if you're trying to do something special, the universe is much smaller. And um, it's a lot harder to get into a niche, uh, especially right out, out of the bat. Um, you, often you can do that by freelancing because then you can pitch niche organizations. But if you, you know, for full-time media jobs, it's pretty hard to be a specialist uh, right out of the box. Uh, no, Bill, that's generally true. But I would just also say that uh, uh, occasionally, if, if, if um, I guess if there's a, a small enough niche, maybe, maybe that's how you kind of separate yourself. You know, I, 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 I think about my, my entry into the business. I was a business reporter. I mean, I was a specialist. I didn't want to do anything, anything else other than that. Um, now, this was obviously uh, many years ago, but uh, there, there weren't um, a lot of uh, folks interested in business reporting in, in those days. So maybe you find an area, again, that, that, that's not high demand that, that, that might uh, prove an, an entree into that uh, particular field. Yeah, uh, and, and the, the other thing is uh, I've seen over time and time again, both in my career and other people's careers, is special interests, special skills can pay off in hugely unexpected ways. Um, um, I remember there was a Newsday reporter who came in as a town beat reporter, but happened to have, I think it was a Chinese studies major and he was fluent in Chinese. Uh, and a couple of years after he was covering the town of Brookhaven, he ended up being the Peking bureau chief because the the guy that was there retired or came back to Newsday, they needed somebody and they said it, there was somebody in, in a house already who was fluent in Chinese and knew Chinese culture. And he went from being a town beat reporter to being bureau chief, you know, with, without passing go. Um, you know, in my case, you know, having been a water person my whole life, uh, one day I get called in by the editor saying, I'm tired of Newsday uh having anybody that's available in the newsroom when the story breaks covering water stories and then we look like total jerks because these people don't know for the bow of a boat from the stern of the boat and i get called in by the editor and say congratulations you're now covering the water you know as, as a new issues beat uh with a sunday column with, with your mugshot and i said okay it sounds pretty good to me you know so you never know but having any kind of interest at all can really pay off 
Uh, okay, any other questions before we move on to resumes? I was gonna just mention um, an answer for Benjamin who had a question about photojournalism in particular. I have found that for those types of roles, he's absolutely right, a staff position are fewer and farther between, but there is a very robust freelance market, especially in New York. Um, given that you mentioned that you are desperately wanting to come back to New York. So that's something you are, you know, it's a risk. It's a, you know, it's a, you have to weigh whether you have, do you have the wherewithal to spend a few months in New York and just get your name out from, from a freelance networking. Um, there are so many jobs that are hired on a freelance basis. And with every single one of those is an opportunity to, to have a relationship with a publisher and expand that relationship based on how much they like your work. So it's really, um, some of it is, I always encourage people not to be passive at all when it comes to seeking out opportunities. Sometimes you just have to make them on your own. Um, and I was so shocked more recently, one of my own junior member, junior producers, um, this is an associate producer. And I, I knew that he was sort of looking around for something that really just kind of matches what he ultimately wants to do. <laughs> and we talked and I've known him for two and a half years. I hired him and um, I mentioned the word freelance and he thought, really? You think I should go freelance? And I thought, I can't believe this has never crossed your mind. <laughs> he was so turned off by the idea of freelance that he just skipped. And he said, I, I've seen plenty of postings on LinkedIn for freelancers, but I never thought I would do it because there are no benefits. And I said, you're 24. What kind of benefits do you need at this point? If you're healthy, knock on wood, this I would highly suggest that that is a risk worth taking because you can easily sort of elevate your, your um, you can almost, promote yourself to positions that you would otherwise be waiting around for um, and by, by again, taking that risk. And it's a really, it's a leap of faith based on the confidence in the skills that you have. And it's a personal decision for everyone, but, but just know that there is a very robust um, freelance network, especially for photojournalists um, in New York and I'm sure other big cities, but you know, I don't think is as, I, I'm not, I wouldn't think that Arizona has as many opportunities for you. So I think it's just, you'll get to that moment in your own life where you just say, you know what, I'm just gonna try this <laughs> and do it. Okay, um, all right, so resumes. Uh, I put up uh, the Press Club uh, website, which I put the link up there on the chat. Um, some of the, some of the uh, some resumes I've done with you know working with uh, young professionals and students I put up there as samples. Um, let me give you the layout of what the consensus I've seen in the in the trade is of what a resume should be, and then uh, we'll let the uh, panelists either argue with me or add to that. So uh, consensus is the journalism resume should be one page, even if you're Walter Cronkite. I know I have a one page resume after 40 years in the field. Uh, you want your contact information. You want to put uh, where you can be reached. Don't don't bog down the resume and, and the recruiter by putting 15 different phone numbers. You know, put one number where you can always be reached. Uh, your one email address. Uh, you know, one uh, maybe a Twitter handle or whatever. Um, is, we'll we'll probably argue about this. Uh, some people like uh, a objective line and some don't. Uh, I like it if you're a beginning journalist. Uh, in particular, because it tells me when I look at the resume, what you want, so that I can say, okay, this person wants to be X, and then I can weigh the whole resume uh, against that. Uh, the other thing is what I always did, and a lot of other recruiters do, is they go to the resume first, and, and if they don't like the resume, then they don't read the cover letter, they don't look at the clips. So, you know, the resume should be sort of self-sufficient and putting an objective line on top, unless you're, unless you're applying for a specific job opening that, you know, that's been advertised. Uh, but we'll come, we'll talk about that. Then you want uh, your journalism and writing experience on top. Uh, definitely do not want college on top, which is what almost every college career center will tell their people not realizing that there is such a thing as a journalism resume. I've had huge arguments with the career center at Hofstra where I'm an alum and work on a lot of committees 
and argued with you know faculty at Stony Brook and a lot of people say, oh, well, they're in college. People want to know where they're in college. And I say, they really don't give a crap. You know, I mean, if, if you went to Harvard, that's nice, but they want to see what, you've, what writing you've done. Uh, so you want to work through your jobs in reverse chronology and then get down to uh, special skills, which should be stuff that's really a skill, not something everybody can do like Microsoft Word. I keep seeing. Uh, you know, on resumes. And I said, yeah, your three-year-old brother or sister can do that. So, the, you know, languages, uh, real skills, you know, editing software, things like that. Um, a lot of editors like um, the personal interest, you know, kind of thing. So that's a, it's a conversation starter. And some of those personal interest things could end up being a job, like in my case, being a lifelong voter. Uh, and, you know, working down, if you're uh, relatively new in the field, you want uh, you want to have uh, references at the bottom, and people can actually talk about what you can do and have done, and uh, and you want to make sure that those people know that you're putting them down because if somebody contacts your reference and they, they don't like you, they're going to say that because their you know their reputation is at stake. So people are very honest when they're contacted about job hunting. But uh, you know that's a very quick summary of what should be there. Um, anybody else? Uh, what, what do you like or not like in resumes? Hey, hey, Bill, I'm with you on everything except one, and that's that's that objective line. And maybe it's just uh, I I haven't I haven't seen many good ones, but I don't get the value of that objective line at all. Um, I just go right to the resume. I tend to skip over it quite honestly and just kind of get get to the meat of the thing. Um, other than that. Um, I'm with you on everything. I, I, I do love special interests, by the way. I, I, I like to see how, how well-rounded um, folks are, um, how you spend your time away from the business. Um, I also, one of the things though that disappoints me often is, is people don't, don't really always sell themselves as best they can with the resume. And I'll give you an example. I've, I've, um, I've come to start asking people just as one, one, one example, um, if they speak any other languages. And there, there are many times when I'll say, oh, you speak whatever it is, and it's not on the resume. And, and then they say, well, I didn't realize, realize it was important. And again, I mean, I stress that you, you need to sell yourself that this is your one, one chance. Everything is important, uh, especially a language skill, by the way, uh, whatever it is. Uh, so that's kind of where I, I am on the resume. The, um, the, the one reason I like the objective line, particularly for younger people is, uh, especially now with well, everybody has all these different, you know, it's, it's everybody has these transferable multiple talents. Uh, you may see a resume with a lot of copy editing on it, but the person doesn't want to be a copy editor. They really want to be a reporter. Uh, and, you know, I just find that useful to know that when I'm looking at the resume because they may have TV experience now, they may have video digital, um, but they really want to be a print reporter or they have print reporter experience, but don't want to do that anymore. They want to switch to video or whatever. So I, I just like to know that going in, but I know a lot of, uh, a lot of editors don't want to see that. They just, they, for various reasons, I know Walter Middlebrook, who I've done a lot of these with, it feels like you do it, but even more, we get into big arguments about objective lines. <laughs> uh, anybody else want to weigh in on, uh, on re the resume style? I would think on objectives, just if you if you have something that you want to explain, then I like an objective line, like exactly kind of what you're just saying, Bill. I've been a copy editor, but now I'm looking to transfer those skills and I think I'm ready for a reporter role. Like you can let me know that straight off the bat and I'm going to look at your resume with a little bit of a different lens. But if it's just, you know, your objective is to get this job that you're applying for, then I don't need to know. Yeah. And when, when I tell people if, you, if they're going to do it, it needs to be short and sweet and, and specifics like entry level print reporter or, you know, entry level TV producer. Um, but if, if all they're interested in is being, you know, a, a, um, a news anchor and that's all they're going to accept and they should just say that and then their resume is weighed against it. Um, the, the other uh, general advice is there should not be um, any wasted words, uh, including the word I. So you don't want to say, I did this. You just say, did it, you know, uh, you know, covered this beat. Don't say, I covered this beat. Um, just go over it or have somebody else go over it and edit out literally every word you can lose without losing any meaning. And then probably the most important advice, and I'm amazed uh, how many people don't do this, is just have it proofread multiple times. Uh, my rule uh, hiring for Gannett, and even when I was you know, at job fairs for Newsday, is the first typo I saw in a resume, I threw it in the garbage. And I said, if you're not, 
I said, this is the most important piece of paper you're ever going to do in your whole life, probably. And if you don't give a crap enough about it to make it accurate and clean, then you, that, that shows me a work skill or lack, lack of work ethic that's going to translate into how you do your jobs. Or if you're lazy in doing the resume, are you going to be lazy you know, doing your job if we hire you? So that, uh, that, that's kind of a hard ass, I know, but that was my policy. If, if the first typo I saw, that was it. And um, the other advice is do not embellish. People will say, you know, I, I agree with Calvin, the skills can be hugely important, particularly now, you know, with push for diversity. Uh, but, you know, you'll see people that say, you know, fluent in Spanish. Uh, I actually know people that have gone to interviews and said they were fluent in a language and the editor they were interviewing with was also fluent and switched the interview to that language. And if they couldn't keep up, that was the end of the interview. So that has uh, happened to me. <laughs> so if you're, you know, if you're conversational, it's one thing. If you're fluent, it's another. You know, if you sort of stumble through it badly, it's not, it shouldn't be on your resume. So um, and I know on Newsday, I think, was the policy in a lot of other places. If you're caught embellishing in any way, uh, even after you're hired, you could be fired. If you say you have a degree from a place that you don't have, uh, you know, you claim any experience or credential that you don't have, that's usually grounds for firing at any point in your career. Bill, I should add on that point that we do do background checks. So it's, it's really difficult to get away with, with things. Yeah, uh, you know, and a lot of small media uh, they may not have the resources to do that, but uh, I, you know, I, I know cases personally where uh, some embellishment has come up, you know, years later, and that person was uh, sort of walked out the door on the spot. Um, I think for um, I just I just want to add, I think for people who are applying to jobs and positions, you know, you got to really think in the context that like this is the first interaction that your employer is going to have with you, like before they physically meet you, before they Google search you anything, they're going to look at this first. So you need to like think in the context of, you know, the recruiters, like what are, what are the key criteria that they're looking for? Um, this is your introduction to them, right? This is, this is it. So like, like, like you kind of said, Bill, like, I don't think it's obscure to think that if there's a typo in something, it's off the table, like, this is your introduction to them, to the business. So it's, these are important details, you know? Yeah, and the, the other problem I see a lot is unnecessary explanation. Um, it, it almost cracks me up if somebody said, okay, you know, it was a sales assistant or a uh, barista at Starbucks. And then they give you an explanation of what they did or they, you know, they worked at the Gap as a sales assistant, mm -hmm. you know, and I'll say, okay, you put, if it's not journalism, particularly you put down the job title if the job title tells you what the job is, stop there. I said, you know, the sales assistant to Gap, summer of eight, eight, uh, 2018, period. Don't tell me that you folded clothes and handled the cash register, you know, and, and, you know, a lot of that even goes for the journalism stuff. It's like, okay, you say you're a beat reporter, tell me what the beat was, uh, you know, period. Don't tell me you went to, you went to school board meetings and, and the nuts and bolts of doing the job. I mean, if it's obvious, don't explain it. Um, all right. Um, any other do's and don'ts for resumes from the from the panelists? I mean, I have one, and but I, I it it's very probably very specific to broadcast. Although I think it it also can be utilized as uh, for digital journalists or whatever. Is make sure your link is on your resume. If you have a link to a portfolio or a uh, your personal website or whatever, make sure it's there and that you can click it and get to it. I, I don't like to go hunting for that kind of thing. Um, if, I, if I look at a resume and I like what I see and then I have to go search in Google to find your, your link because you didn't put, that drives me crazy. So like make it easy for people who are in positions of hiring to find your work and see what you're all about. Um, okay, we have a question in the chat. Uh, someone from, it's coming from Ecuador. Uh, should I let me know experience? Uh, there's a rule of thumb. Um, basically, you know, the golden rule of resumes is everything you've ever done, you know, particularly in, in, in experience in the field needs to be there. Uh, gaps are very dangerous. I always, I always, uh, one old time editor who, you know, talked to me about recruiting said, uh, if I see a resume with it, with a time gap in it, I think you were in jail. I, I presume the worst, if you're not putting filling in the, that time element that I presume you were, 
at a minimum, not doing anything towards your career and maybe you were in jail or something worse. So um, whatever country it is, whatever you've done, uh, basically people want to, you know, recruiters want to see your whole track record all the way back to college and even to high school if you did journalism in high school. So, uh, but, you, but there, there is a, people always say, I can't get this on one page. I, I have a standing offer where I said, I'll buy people lunch or dinner if, if I can't get their resume down to one page. I've never paid out yet. So, so you, you can do it. Um, terms of advice, switching careers. Um, the resume would be the same uh, if you want to, if uh, you, you know, and some people like, you know, I know I've worked at people I mean, you know, who were teachers and decided they want to be a journalist and, and made the transition. So I think you do everything, you know, you, you do the resume, your journalism experience first, other work experience after that. And, you know, that's where the cover letter would come in. If you want to change careers, you really have to sort of, you can explain, you know, what, what your mindset is for that. Uh, okay, any other, any other questions from uh, the audience here about resumes? Okay, so um, let's move on to the cover letter. What what uh, what do you recruiters like to see in a cover letter, and what don't you want to see? I hate cover letters. I mostly don't read them. Oh, I'm the opposite. I love them. A, a good cover letter can can hook me in. Uh, I love a good cover letter. And okay, well, but it's a good me, point. I'm oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah oh, Bernice, I, what, what what makes a good cover letter? Um, uh, so I got an I, I got a cover letter just recently from a, a a reporter, and it was clear from the way he wrote it that he looked up our website, he looked at a couple of shows, he uh, looked me up on LinkedIn, he knew a little bit about me just from that. So he really uh, crafted that about the, the, the kinds of stories that we do and how he could fit into that, um, that, that, that newsroom. And he had a fun, you know, a few little funny little things that sort of spoke to me and said, okay, he's done his homework. I'm not gonna get that from a resume. I will get that maybe from a conversation later, but his resume was okay his cover letter was outstanding. His cover letter got him an interview, it got him a flight out here, and it's probably gonna get him his job. Okay. Yeah, I was just gonna add that uh, uh, that's a great story, Bernice, but uh, the, the thing is typically those really good as, um, cover letters are so far and few between, I've, I've found. Um, most of them are not nearly as good as that, that one. So I'm, I mean, I guess I'm not really a big fan of them. Aaron, you're not either. No, oh, maybe I just haven't gotten any good ones. <laughs> what do you okay. wanna... I'm sorry, Nancy, go on. I was gonna say some um, some places you can't get around not sending the cover letter based on whatever you know software they're using. I will tell you there are certain. So I am not a fan of the cover letter because you know I can pretty much scan the resume and see if there's a potential match. But um, sometimes some cover letters though are so bad that I will not even look at that person's resume. So I recently saw one, it was one line. It just said, this looks like a good match, call me. And I said, absolutely not. <laughs> so yes, there are times when a particular job posting requires you to send a cover letter. So then you you obviously should do your homework and make and cater it to the place that you're applying to. But so I appreciate it then, but I, I'm just being honest. I hardly ever look at it unless there's one that sort of strikes my eye and more so um, the bad ones strike my eye before the good ones. Yeah, I find what, you're, what you and uh, Aaron are saying is, is more common than most is the uh, Either you know the people either read the I, I always read the resumes first and you know then if that if, that, if I like that then I went to the cover letter then I went to the clips but um, for those of you who like them and those who don't uh, what what do you like to see in a cover letter and what should people not put in a cover letter? 
I just want to I just wanted to mention too there's this like generic style that people use for cover letters like do not do that do not reuse a cover letter for like several jobs you're applying to it needs to be catered to each position otherwise because like recruiters know that like that's a red flag they recognize that they see that so just throwing that out there don't do that try to make it like enticing unique use your own voice like these are things that writers and journalists need to have um, and I think if you can convey that in a cover letter, um, obviously, like it kind of depends on the business and the recruiter. But um, I think if you can convey that, that that's that can that can potentially win them over, like in Bernice's case with that one. Uh, yeah, report. yeah, it, it, yeah. They definitely have to be specific. Like I, I got my first daily job at a Gannett paper in New Jersey, in part because. Um, I said, I really want to work at your paper because you have a mix of everything from farm country, you know, right into urban issues in plain, downtown Plainfield, New Jersey. And it would be great to get all that different experience in one place. Uh, and when I went in for the interview, the editor mentioned that he said, you know, it's great that it's I, I, like, like Bernie said, it's obvious you, you've done your homework about the paper, but also I like the fact that you're open to everything and want to learn all this stuff. So, you know, the general, hi, I, you know, I'm looking for a daily job and I really want to work for you without being explaining why or being specific is, is usually pretty deadly. Uh, anything else people want or don't want in a cover letter? Okay, so if we've covered that, any questions from the audience about cover letters? Okay, let's uh, move on to um, the, the, one, you know, the one thing you wanna be careful with the cover letters, it has to be in English. It has, again, no typos because the typo in the cover letter to me is just as bad as, as in the resume. Uh, you know, it has to be polite. I mean, some of them are, are just rude or, you know, slangy or just, you know, not, not at all inviting. So you, be careful with that. Um, okay, so next thing is uh, clips and tapes. So what, what do you guys want to have? What don't you want to have? And how would you like them presented? So uh, Calvin, you want to start? Bill, I'm going to pass on that. I don't have much experience with clips and tapes. So I'm, I'm going to let some of the others speak to that. That's more in their, in their area. Well, what about newspaper clips? Oh, clips, yeah, I have to see clips. Um, and it, 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 it gets back to the issue you were raising with, with freelancing and, and, and other writing opportunities. Um, we need to see that there is a body of work. I mean, we, we need to see that, that, that you have been at, at least making an effort to, to do the job that, 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 that you hope to pursue professionally um, at some point. Um, uh, the clip should be a, a good mix of, of different kinds of writing, hard news. Uh, there should be some, some featurey writing there also, again, just to get a sense of, of, of your range and depth. Um, not too many. I mean, I would say um, eight to 10 or so. Um, and um, again, you just want them to be diverse. Uh, or do you want them to be different lengths? Um, you just want to show your range and, and versatility as well, that you're able to cover lots of, lo lots of different subjects. Okay, now how, physically, do you want them probably not cut out of a newspaper, but uh, do you want them on photocopied on eight by 10? Do you want them uh, digitally? Bill, I miss those days of, of clipping and uh, taping those, those things on pages, but yes, yes, electronically is much better these days. Okay. <laughs> um, and how current, uh, is it a red flag if they're not, at least some of them aren't particularly current? They should be current, definitely. And that's my point. I mean, you need to show that you've been doing this over time, um, okay. that you've been consistent, um, that you, you, you're really committed to this and that you're going to make it work. And how old can some of them be without looking weird? I'm not too much concerned about being too old. Um, because again, I mean, that's a good way of seeing in, in, any progress. I mean, you show me something that's, that's five or six years old and I, I hold that up against something that, that you've written last week and I get a sense of, how much you've grown and, and developed over that time frame. So that's good. Okay. That's good. All right. Well, um, anybody else? What, what are you looking for in terms of uh, audio TV clips or web clips? For, oh, go ahead. Nancy. No, no, go ahead. I was going to say for TV, I mean, uh, we, I like to see kind of a, a, a compilation of live shots and, and, stand-ups and uh, unless you are say an investigative reporter um, 
it should be like Calvin was mentioning something that has a variety of types of stories or or circumstances, and then um, and then I like to see four or five full stories if possible. Though I can I I do go and look at people's bylines on their website on the websites and see what they've done yesterday or today, and then for producers I I get um, usually full shows within the last month, and then I ask for yesterday's show. Erin, Nancy? I've, um, I've actually hired someone, uh, a producer, a shooting producer, based on her demo reel, because it was so good. And it was a Vimeo link um, attached to her email to me. The, um, just the aesthetic quality of that, of that video that she created spoke to everything that I was looking for. So by the time I actually met this person in, in real life, I had already in my mind thought that this was going to be a hire, um, literally just based on her work. Same goes for editors, video editors and photographers. So if you have your own site or um, again, a, a, like a compilation video that you've created um, that work goes a long way because it's our first chance for us to look at the physical work that you can do as a specialist before we even have the face-to-face -face meeting. And then for on-air people, just because I've uh, looked at hundreds of, of demo reels, um, and I, I hope that Bernice, you agree with this, but I will tell you the like dirty truth about how people view these reels. And there's a reason why most of them are orchestrated a certain way. Typically, you know, after we see your name and contact information, typically there's a montage at the front of it. <clears throat> Just very quick cuts of your best looking standups or, you know, in studio, in the field, whatever it is. Because the truth of it is that the people who are screening for on-air talent, they are first looking at you from a physical, <laughs> standpoint. So, so how does this person look? And oftentimes, most reels don't get watched for the entire length. So there was a question about how long a demo uh, reel should be. It is so important to have your best looking material at the very front of that, of that sequence, because most times you're never even going to get to the three minute mark. People, I off, there are many times where it's under 10 seconds and I may stop it and move on to the next one. So usually the kind of, you know, uh, dynamic is that we're looking for, you know, what does this person look like? And then if we're interested, we may pay attention to what, how do they sound? So now we're looking at more of the real. And then finally, if you're really interested, then you want to know how they write or how they craft stories or what's their skill when it comes to telling a story. And then you're going to watch those three or more packages that they would have put towards the you know, on the backside of that demo reel. And that's typically how I screen. And this is just a practice that I don't think enough people are told that just the real raw truth about um, how important it is to sort of like front load your demo and also, you know, the substantive part. Oftentimes, most people don't even get to that section. I, I think that. that. I would agree I think, with every single bit of it. I, I do listen for a good voice. I, I you know, a good voice is a very strong, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it's very important. I, I think the front end loading uh, was also a, uh, a thing for, you know, if you're doing print, like Calvin said, if you do eight to 10 clips, the um, the presumption is that the your your best stuff is up front, so you should do that because you know the editor looking at them may only read the first one or maybe the first couple. Um, and when you get to, when you get to the the end of the pile, if they're mediocre, don't send them. You know, basically send fewer clips, but make sure they're all good. But uh, they should all you know the best stuff should be up front to catch people's attention because you don't know how many they'll read. Uh, the other error that a lot of people make is uh, in, in print is they'll send the story. Uh, sort of a routine story with multiple bylines. And then the presumption is obviously it's gone through editors after you wrote it, but if there's multiple bylines, it's almost impossible to figure out who did what. So um, unless it's a big investigation story, you know, that, that you want to 
it, that was fairly in depth. You don't want to just put uh, you know uh, multiple byline stories on there. And also, Bill, one of the things I did not mention about those clips is that we assume that uh, that that there's been some level level of editing of, of those stories. Um, you really don't know, <laughs> honestly, how much they've been edited. So that's why we at Newsday invite our candidates to come in and actually try out uh, uh, for a couple of days and and uh, 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 cover events live so we can actually see what what that raw copy looks like because that's really the only way to really gauge someone's writing by by, by seeing it uh, live and up, up close and in person. Yeah, do, do, the, do others do uh, tryouts too? Yeah, you know, so for you, some positions at the post, but none of the positions that, that I hire for, but uh, generally for writers and editors, yeah. Okay. We do writing tests for uh, reporters and producers and then for Anchors, we do a, a in studio real, you know, test. Uh, the, I mean, the other nice thing about tryouts, besides the employer getting to check you out, you get to check out the operation. Yes. I mean, sometimes, yeah. you know, I've gone for you know interviews and things, and I walk out saying, "God, I don't want to work here," you, you know, <laughs> and under any circumstances. So, you know, getting to work with the editors and see the newsroom atmosphere is, is, is pretty valuable for both sides. Uh, somebody asked about, uh, not everyone is a reporter. How do you copy editors show their work? Uh, a lot of that would be, as Calvin said, uh, I, I, did a, I did a week tryout at Newsday for copy editing, which I really didn't want to do just so I could get out of the way and become a reporter. But the um, that's probably the best way. The other thing is if you've done like, if, if you know, if you write a lot, lot, lot of good headlines, for instance, you know, kind of snappy headlines, you could sort of send the compilation of that. But um, I think, you know, for copy editors, it's more of a tryout thing. I would, I don't know if Calvin, if you would agree with that. Absolutely, 100%, yeah. <laughs> okay, um, let's see, any other questions? All right, so, um, now the actual application process at this point in time is it do you want to, do all of you want it strictly online or do you actually want an envelope with a, you know a paper resume and clips in it or you know a, 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 it's a USB in an envelope or should everything be digital at this point? Everything, yeah, everything has to be digital. Although if there are candidates that I really feel strongly about if, if I really like them, I will suggest that they also um, contact me directly so that I can uh, uh, refer them to, to the hiring manager. Okay, but you all agree that everything should come in, you know, as an attachment kind of thing, you know, or website. Um, I think we, oh, okay. Uh, all right, so um, it, the uh, it's a little dated, but it's still useful on the chat I put in uh, a Boston uh, University professor named Michelle Johnson did a kind of how-to for an online portfolio, um, which is, you know, is, is worth taking a look at to get a sense if you're going to do this all online, you know, which, which you recommended. Um, okay, so the last thing I want to, uh, any, any questions from anybody before we move on again? Okay, so the last thing would be uh, interview techniques. Um, and this is why I like to talk about there's, there's a, what I call editor speak. Editors have this way of talking in, in sort of code. And if you don't understand the code, you're at a disadvantage. When I was beating my brains out trying to get my first daily job, um, a lot, you know, most three quarters people didn't, didn't respond to what I sent in. Um, then I get a lot of, you know, we don't have any openings go away kind of letters for the people that did respond. But then you get these kind of interesting letters that say, well, we have nothing now, we have a hiring freeze, but if you're in the area, you know, stop by and, and let's chat. Um, and I, I picked up on that right away and said, okay, well, I'm gonna be, make sure I'm in the area and chat because you gotta really be proactive. Um, and then later, as I got in more into the recruiting side, people would, you know, would tell me they're kind of veiled uh, editor speaks kind of things. And if they drop that hint, and the people don't follow up on it, then they say, okay, this is not somebody I want. So you have to, uh, you know, gr you know, grab onto any opportunity that people sort of va vaguely put in whatever kind of response you have. So that idea of if you're in the neighborhood, drop in for coffee is if you don't do that, you're pretty dumb. But um, 
the, basically the whole process we've described it to this point is you want to get in the door and sit down with an editor who might hire you. So uh, that's really uh, the goal of, of the whole job process is get in, get in the door and talk to people. Um, so what, what do you guys like it, to see in an interview and what don't you like to see when somebody's sitting across from you? I, I'll, I'll go. Um, first, I, I really gravitate towards people who are dynamic and show that they're very interested in the job. That sounds very obvious, but I've seen plenty of people for, for whom I think, did someone make you come here? <laughs> Why do you seem uninterested? So there, there's that. But then there's also um, someone who really knows, and as again, this speaks to doing your homework, who really knows the brand. So you can tell immediately if, if this person has you know, no familiarity with anything that your company may have produced or put out or, or even just um, you know, whether it's local news, they don't watch it or it's a paper, they've never picked it up, or digital, they've never gone to, to your site. It's immediately transparent if you are dealing with someone who is unfamiliar with the company or the work that you put out. And then the, just one other um, really big turnoff I found is sometimes people are a little overconfident and a little too, and it comes off as arrogant. Um, there's just a lot of speaking about themselves and, how great they are at everything they do. And it's a balance of being um, respectful and knowledgeable and having high energy, meaning like you're showing that you are interested, engaged, because it almost is a, is a, um, a hint at what type of worker you're going to be. So someone who comes off as completely arrogant in an interview, I know immediately that this person may not be the best to be managing other people or that they may exude this sort of energy with the rest of the newsroom. And as you're trying to build teams, you're trying to build you know, people who will work well with one another. And so someone who has a positive outlook is energetic to a point, uh, knowledgeable about the company and the job that they're applying for. Um, and also being um, inquisitive and having questions like Helvin mentioned earlier. Those are all sort of the recipes for what makes a really great interview. And also the personality. I, I know somebody mentioned, you know, um, not only do you want someone who is highly skilled at the, at the role that they're going to be stepping into, but you also are looking for good people who will fit in in a newsroom and be a valuable team member. Okay. Anybody else? Do's and don'ts for interviews? I think in this like digital space, um, it is important to make sure that you know how to sign on to like the Zoom link or the Meetup link or whatever that you're going to be beforehand. Make sure that you have a good internet connection. Um, you know, if you're you know well lit, that's helpful. Make sure that you have either headphones or a microphone working. Um, you know, especially because I'm I'm hiring for digital roles in particular, but I think everybody right now is hiring for, in some respect, something digital because we're all working from home. Um, it just, you know, it kind of makes me worry a little bit when somebody like loses connection, like, well, is that going to be happening to you all day long? Are we going to, you know, how are, how are you going to get around these technical problems when you're actually working? So I would say that for right now. And then one other thing that's kind of a pet peeve of mine is um, if somebody sort of like, scoffs at a question that I ask or implies that something is like obvious and I think if I'm asking the question then it's not obvious to me uh, maybe the reason that I'm asking a question that seems obvious or redundant is because you haven't yet given me an answer that makes sense to me so I'm actually trying to give you the benefit of the doubt by asking you again or asking you in a different way to try to have you explain yourself um, so that's like a that's like a, a double nail on the coffin if if first of all, I'm giving you a second chance to answer a question and then second of all, you've, you know, sort of scoff at it or, or think it's something that's, you know, should be obvious, but it's not obvious to me. I would just add that uh, you, you should not show up in jeans and a t-shirt. Um, <laughs> I like a tie and a guy, um, on a guy, uh, but again, I'm, you don't have to be formal, but you should at least be clean and pressed and, you know, shave and 
I think you know what I mean. I think you know what I mean. Professional attire. Yes, there you go. That's what I mean. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I've actually seen some of the t-shirt and ripped jean, you know, job applicants. Um, and, you know, it's also interesting that when I when we do these journalism conferences live, I'm always curious how people will come to those because the focused people that I know are going to do well are dressed like it's a job interview because they're going to meet recruiters and. Uh, it, you know, and, and, but you'll, you'll see like in, in the same room for a panel, you'll see the people in a you know, jacket and tie and the people with the ripped t rock and roll t-shirt. And it's like, okay, you're here to network and you're gonna meet professionals and you're gonna come across as like, I'm a Led Zeppelin fan. I mean, it's just, it's just bizarre to me is people don't think about it. Um, a, a couple of other things is, um, you know, a lot of the panels have mentioned do your homework. Uh, see if it's a tv station or newspaper you know get to see the product over you know for multiple days before you go so you can talk about it the um when i when i got hired by my gannett paper uh the first it also you need to know like often a lot of the first question you'll get is why do you want to work here so you need to have a specific answer like something better than i just need a job and you're the first one you know to answer my my application um, but, but I got that question from the editor of my Gannett paper, and he said, um, you know, why do you want to work here? And I had a reason. And then he said, what do you like about the paper? What don't you like? Because I had been a weekly editor. So they were ultimately looking to me as a reporter and then as, as an editor. And um, I had, this is back before digital, I had them send me a package of, the, of like a week's worth of papers, which I had read carefully. And I, he said, what do you like and don't like? And I said, well, what bothers me is your uh, a suburban paper, you know, in the area of the New York Times and the Star Ledger in New Jersey, but you put a lot of, uh, you know, AP, national, international, and state news on the front page, and you don't really play up your local staff written coverage. And I would imagine a lot of your readers must get the Times or the Star Ledger, and they're really buying the Courier News to see local stuff. And I thought, you know, and that's how I felt. And I figured I'd better be honest. And I waited. I hope I didn't insult him or something. And he paused and he said, you know, I've been thinking the same thing for a long time, and it's great, great that you, you know, that's how you feel, and it, it's pushing me towards making a change. So, and he, and he told me later that's one of the reasons he hired me because I had, you know, I had actually looked at the paper. Um, the other thing is, if you're going for a physical interview, go early, see the area. I mean, the reason I could talk about how I was interested in both urban problems and and farm news is, I, you know, I went down a couple hours early. I drove all around the coverage area. Uh, just checked out the whole area. I got a sense of what the, the coverage area was like, and that came in very handy. Uh, and you also want to go early because uh, this is my biggest horror story, is I got an interview at the Levittown uh, Daily in Pennsylvania. The editor gave me instructions how to get there, which I wrote down, which I read back to him, but I didn't look at a map. Uh, and I figured how much time it would take to get there like a half hour early and, and left a half hour early. And it turns out he forgot to tell me to make a right turn on the Pennsylvania Turnpike. So I ended up in Delaware because I hadn't done my homework. And a half hour before the interview, I'm on the wrong side of Philadelphia. Uh, and this was uh, on a Sunday where he was coming in special because I was working for the weekly and couldn't get away. So he said, well, I have to go to the paper and do some paperwork on a Sunday. Uh, and then I, I'm trying to call, explain what happened. The switchboard is shut down. I found his phone number at home, called his wife who drove to the newspaper to tell him what was going on. And I got there all disheveled and like freaked out. Uh, and needless to say, it wasn't the best <laughs> interview. Um, but the, uh, luckily the guy said, I'm not gonna hire you because I somebody who wants, used to work here wants to come back. Uh, despite your lack of navigational skills, uh, he recommended me to another paper in his chain. But um, you, wanna, you, know, you wanna do the homework, you wanna know the area, you wanna get there early so you relax and uh, you know, really know the product. Uh, also, Bill, I would just add one, one other thing too. You know, interviewing can be stressful, obviously. Uh, so if, if you have some concerns or questions um, as the interviewee, there, there's no shame in, in pulling out a list of, of things you, you wanna discuss. I mean, I, again, I think that just, just shows honesty and, and uh, forward looking thinking. So jot it down, uh, don't be afraid of that. The, the other two pieces of advice is, uh, I found it very effective interviews to say, why should I want, you know, after they ask you why you want to work there, uh, uh, I would often say, um, what, why do you think I should work here? Why should I want to work here? And let them sell me on the job in the newspaper. Um, and I, I, I found editors were impressed by that level of inquisitiveness. Um, 
I think that's pretty much it. Um, anybody else have anything to add on that or any questions on interview techniques? Uh, we had a qu another question in the chat to follow up on the copy editor question. If, if the editors don't read the cop cover letters, how does anyone earn a tryout? Um, I mean, my answer would be based on your experience. I mean, if you've done editing elsewhere, that's what's going to get you the job. And if you haven't done a lot of copy editing but want to get into it, then you, you, I guess you would explain that in the cover letter. But uh, uh, Calvin, does that make sense? Makes sense to me, yeah. Okay. Um, all right. Um, all right, so um, that's basically it for my agenda. Does anybody, uh, either anybody panelists want to add anything or does anybody uh, listening have any other questions? I actually want to ask my, uh, my fellow recruiters here, do you guys think that it's appropriate to send a thank you note after an interview? Do you think that's uh, mandatory, formal kind of uh, to show initiative or do you think that it's just like cliche and over, overdone? I love a good thank you note. I save thank you notes. I do too. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Plus, it, 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 if you do, I mean, I think you should always send a thank you note, but I think that I'd go a step further and say a thank you note should also include a question, another follow up question or something that you can, that shows that you were still thinking about your interview even after it ended. Um, you know, I, but I, yes, I do, I do like a nice thank you note. Nobody ever suggested that to me. I think it's a great idea. I wish I had thought of that when I was job hunting. <laughs> okay, does anybody else have anything? Uh, if not, I uh, wanna thank our panelists for giving up the, part of their busy days and everybody else who's uh, gotten over Zoom fatigue to uh, join us today. And uh, as I said, we'll be doing this conference uh, in March next year at Hofstra Live. So I hope to see some of you there. And uh, some of you recruiter folks uh, who are local will be hearing from me again uh, for next year. Um, all right, well, thanks very much. And uh, we, there's a break now uh, at 4.30, there's a, um, a social mixer with a trivia contest for anybody that's interested. And uh, again, we have a program uh, going from 10 o'clock tomorrow through the Mark of Excellence Awards at 3.30. So um, uh, those of you who are, are uh, particularly students and young pros, uh, check it on out. All right. So thanks, Thank folks. You. Have a great Thank day. You. Bye. Bye. Mr. Blyer? Yes. Um, hi. I'm the annoying copy editor. Um, <laughs> I got, I, I, I logged on a little late, so I don't know what you did at the beginning, but um, I have a question. I haven't uh, been working. I left my job to um, take care of my parents. Um, and now that they're both dead, I'm gonna have to soon uh, start looking for work. Here's my, if you're not reading the co uh, the cover letters, how do you explain this? That's that's where you explain things. Um, well, pe I mean, pe people read them, but, but as, as you heard, is it's sort of not the go-to play. It, it, there's so much of this process that's counterintuitive, and that's one of them. I mean, you, you send a package that has a cover letter, has a resume, has clips, and the people that do that, if you don't know the system, assume that's the way they're read by the editors. But as you heard, it's not usually, uh, I mean, what, maybe one out of five recruiters I know actually read the cover letter first. But um, this is where we get into the whole objective line on the resume question. So like, um, if your background isn't obvious for what, you're, what you want to do, then you have to explain it, which is why I like the, the objective line, because if uh, you've been doing other kind of jobs, you haven't been working a while, um, putting on the top of the resume what exactly what you're trying to do, I think, is useful. But um, if you know if the resume leaves questions, sometimes that will drive people to the cover letter too. So you never know. But um, you know, if you have some experience in the past and you took a break, um, I mean, that's you're definitely going to explain that. It's uh, if you haven't worked for a while. Um, you know, I mean, the presumption. You know, I, I kid about people saying, so presume you're in jail, but. Um, you know, it's, it, it, it's maybe sexist, but if you're a woman, people may 
it's kind of the obvious thing is, well, you took a break to raise a family, um, but you somehow you have to explain it, usually in the cover letter, and it, it'll come up in the, uh, it'll always come up in an interview, because the question is, okay, what have you been doing? You know, if, you're, if your resume shows a break, then people want to know what you were doing with that time. Uh, the good news is if you're into copy editing, for every reporting job out there, there's probably five or 10 copy editing jobs. And even though they like the Times and some papers have been cutting back to save money on copy editors, the, uh, uh, there's, there's always a demand for copy editors somewhere and not always a demand for reporters. So uh, even if you haven't done it in a while, if you, have, if you have copy editing skills, you can always find a job. Uh, Newsday kept me in the wilds of New Jersey for six years because uh, they needed cut. They, they looked at me and said, okay, he's a, re he's a reporter, but he's also been a, a, a news editor in a college paper. He was a weekly newspaper editor. He's the kind of person who went on the copy desk. And I didn't understand it at the time, but it was actually like an unwritten rule that anybody with copy editing or management editing potential would not be hired as a reporter until they played out the copy editing role. So I actually had to finally give up after six years of reporting and editing in New Jersey, go in and do a week tryout as a copy editor. And I flubbed it, um, not on purpose, but what happened was the, the chief copy editor, her father died the first night of my tryout. And um, I was supposed to get sit down if it was a week try and you're supposed to get sit down with the editor, uh, the, the slot editor or, the, or the, ed, the chief copy editor for the whole paper, the news editor, and, and get feedback after every night and said, okay, you know, you did this good, you didn't do that. And because she disappeared to go take care of this family matter, I never got any feedback the whole week. So the only feedback I got was looking at what they did to what I did. So I'd look at the headlines, see how they changed them. I'd look at what uh, they did to the copy. And they'd say here, edit the story. And they wouldn't say edit it down. Uh, it's a wire story. They wouldn't say edit it down from a thousand words to 300. They, they would say edit it. So I cut it down to what I thought was reasonable. I cut out you know, a lot of extraneous quotes. So maybe I cut it to 500 words when they really wanted it to three, but they never told me what to do. So at the end of the week, I sit down with the chief copy editor and she says, well, we like your headlines. You know, you, 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 you're good with the copy. It's clear, you know, well-organized, good transitions, but you weren't tough enough. You know, you let too much stuff slip by that could have been cut. And I was starting to protest and I said, wait a minute, I don't even want this job. <laughs> so I just sat there and I smiled. I said, okay, thank you. Uh, a week later, I got a, a, a letter from the, uh, actually a phone call from the legendary Bob Green who was in charge of the reporting staff saying, okay, now we got this copy editing crap out of the way, I can give you a reporting job. So they brought me in immediately for a reporting tryout and I got a job two weeks later. So um, there, there's a million copy editing jobs, even in, even in you know, in a, uh, with the newspaper industry that's that's contracting and they, everybody needs copy editors. So yeah, that's I, I hope that's encouraging for you. Yeah, I, I, I have a, a lot of experience. I, I worked at the New York Times for almost 10 years and I took one of the many buyouts um, in, in 2009. And um, after that, I, I the last job I had, I worked at ESPN. Um, the magazine and um, then, uh, <laughs> then things happen. So I, um, I've been a little over five years. I've been, you know, out of work. So, um, yeah, but if you, if you have the New York times, if you've been a New York times copy editor, you can work anywhere. <laughs> That's what I thought when I left. Um, yeah. It, it, it wasn't easy getting the job at ESPN. I think the only reason I got it was because uh, I was willing to be part-time. Yeah. But, yeah, I mean, you may have to start part-time. I mean, I mean, Newsday, I know, hires a lot of part-time copy editors too. Um, but they, um, you know, as you know, the Times basically, you know, went in and, you know, kind of just cut their copy desk in half, you know, and and you can tell because now I, it, the first time in my life I see typos in the New York Times, you know, but... Yeah, well, wow. when I mean, when I left, it sort of was become, well, first of all, it was still that the decade of hand wringing over what do we do about digital? And and um, so they started to focus everything on that. And, and it kind of seemed like we were superfluous anyway, um, because it, it was like they put things on on the web before they'd been copy edited fully. And then they, I don't know, it was like, you know. And you'd go back and copy edit, and then they'd put a new version on that was, you know, well copy edited. <laughs> yeah. You know, 
it's that whole, you know, get it online before the other guy gets it online. I don't know how I have issues with how that makes any sense, but, um, you know, so, and then they were just trying to cut people because of, you know, losing money and whatever at the time. Yeah. But there's also a lot of freelance copy job, sitting book manuscripts and, uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, uh, corporate, corporate, you know, uh, projects, they want copy editors. The, um, I'm trying to think of a good way to find them. Now, where, where are you located in the city or? I'm sorry. Um, where, where, uh, are you, where are you located? Outside of Boston. Outside of Boston. Outside of Boston. Uh, Cause there's, you know, there's the, the uh, New England pro chapter of SPJ. I don't know if you're an SPJ member, that's, but yeah, um, uh, you know, Jordan and those guys uh, should be able to uh, help you network to find something um you know the, i'm trying um when i did this last year i had the globe uh, the globe's uh, administration editor on the program and she was a very nice woman i mean that that's a possibility too i guess but um yeah i mean the, the, you know the, if it's an understandable gap that really shouldn't be an issue i mean copy and copy editing is still kind of copy editing so it, i mean i would imagine with your credentials it shouldn't be that difficult to find something other than the fact the whole industry is contracting, but uh, yeah. <laughs> but the, you know who's still the, the publications that are still out there need copy editors. So. This is true. Yeah. Okay. I appreciate your time. Yeah, but yeah, I would definitely uh, get the New England Pro Chapter up there. You know, uh, networking for you. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. All right. Good luck. Thank you. Uh, a few people still here. Anybody else have any questions that I can help you with? Hi. Um, yeah, if you don't mind, I, I could ask a question. Yeah, go ahead. I'm, I've been freelancing and, and I do commercial work. I, I work with various clients, helping them to, to tell their stories. And I do content mostly for the web. And I liked when I was doing journalism, when I was writing feature stories and my dream has always been to write somewhere for somewhere like Psychology Today or a science magazine or something really interesting where people are innovating and, and changing lives and things like that. And um, so my question is, because I've had a tough time getting journalism jobs because a lot of them re require driver's license and I'm blind. And my question is, am I kind of, I'm, I'm trying to figure out if I'm going about the freelance thing the right way and, and how I can transfer some of the, the commercial experience that I've been gaining to, to help me on the journalism path as well. Um. Yeah, well, I mean, freelance, did, did you listen to the freelance panel previously? I did, yeah. Okay. And it was very so, helpful. Yeah, I mean, I learned a lot about freelance pitching. is a lot more flexible because, you know, you, you're pitching the stories, you can do them at your own pace, you know, in your own way. Um, you know, the problem is if you get a journalist job, they expect you to be, able to, you know, go out and cover fires, go to school board meetings. And, um, you know, there's been a lot more effort to be more diverse and hire handicapped people and things. But it's still hard to get a full-time job uh, if, if it limits what you can do. But, you know, freelance is, is probably uh, a lot more, you know, malleable in terms of how you do it. Um, you know, and what happens is if, you, if you're trying to do for a niche, niche magazine, then you need credentials. Um, so if, you, if you're on a write for psychology today, uh, you know, they may have some general interest things where you're interviewing psychologists, but uh, uh, generally a lot of magazines in particular um, and even newspapers, you know, they're looking for some kind of expertise to write about the subject. Uh, I do a lot of freelancing because my two big areas are history and maritime stuff. So I, you know, I write for professional Mariner magazine and boating magazines. Uh, and they love the fact that I have the journalism experience and also the practical knowledge of how boats work. Uh, mm -hmm. So, you know, I've had, you know, I've had editors seek me out and heard that you can, because there's a lot of people that know boats but can't write and people that know boats, uh, you know, can write but don't know boats. So right. uh, developing that niche expertise is great. You know, and, and I'm a historian as well as a journalist. So, uh, you know, I can sell a lot of magazine and newspaper stories on, on history. But I mean, if you're interested in psychology, you can try to do stories on it and then, you know, develop an expertise. And the more you do and the more clips you get, then you sort of get, you know, get, it becomes a sort of rolling thing where you get, uh, 
you know, you start to get more and more assignments, more experience, more credentials, and you know, just one thing helps the other. Mm -hmm. but, uh, yeah, and it's just kind of that that entryway where you're kind of just by yourself, and yeah, that, that's but, part of why I, I went into commercial work because I, I ended up networking with other business owners and being able to get projects that way by actually speaking to people. I feel like this freelance journalism thing is kind of lonely. You, you're just pitching and you're getting nowhere and hearing from no one unless you happen to get a pitch that's accepted. So I'm trying to figure out where that community comes in and also how to, how to keep generating those ideas when you're alone. Um, where are you located physically? I'm on Long Island. Oh, okay. So um, where, where on the island? I live in East Northport. Okay. Because um, are you a press club member? Uh, I'm not a member because you have to be a member of the... SPJ. A ASJA, I think, right? Uh, no, it's society. ASJA or is it... P just, just SPJ. Oh, is it just SPJ? Yeah. Okay. I thought they had some other credential that you needed that I didn't have. Um. Well, basically, um, interest in journalism would do it. Um, S Society of Professional Journalists, which is sponsoring this conference, um, is the biggest overall journalism group. And then there's other uh, more niche groups like uh, uh, for Black journalists, Asian American journalists. Um, but the Press Club of Long Island is the local chapter of the Society of Professional Journalists. So if you join SPJ, uh, you can also become a, a member of the Long Island chapter. We don't even, we, there's national dues for SPJ, but we don't charge local dues for the press club. Um, but um, we can, uh, we don't have like a freelancing committee, but we do a lot of networking. So yeah, uh, I've been to a few of the, the meetings yeah. too. Yeah, actually, I think you look familiar. Yeah, um, it hasn't been. Uh, Newsday, I think. Um, yeah, it hasn't been in a while, but uh... Yeah, they were well, interesting. They were yeah, we have done, uh, everything we've done for the last year is obviously has been online. Right. But um, I would encourage you to join SPJ, join the become a press club member, and um, we you know we have people uh, like Lisa Burby who you heard on the previous panel. You know she's yes. been active. She's active in in the press club. Done a lot of programs and people like her you could definitely network with. And um, you know I, I sort of specialize in helping people link up you know in internships and. Other things. So, if um, you, you, I mean that, that's that's one community you could join, and then uh, SBJ has the freelancing community that Hillary runs. Uh, so, yeah, there's a lot of a lot of networking opportunities that would help you find uh, connections and, and uh, writing sources. Oh, I didn't realize Hillary ran a committee, also. Bill. Yeah, she 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 heads the SPJ um, freelancing committee. But um, oh, interesting! I didn't know there was. Yeah, but I, I could I could probably um, link you up with some freelance, uh, you know, if you're, if you're from Long Island because that's where my, yeah. that's where I am. So, because she had a great idea about pitch buddies, that sounds interesting. Yeah, I wonder how that would work, or because I mean, I, I've I've really jumped into the networking world, and I've gotten business projects and opportunities that way, and now the online networking world has blossomed tremendously. Yeah, so um, that, that's that's helped me. But in terms of you know getting more steady work, I've still struggled with it. Yeah, well, I mean it, it's it's a you know it's this kind of slow process of developing a reputation and getting clips and experience. Um, you know, and, and if you're lucky, like like Liza is, and to some extent like me, is people come to you know people reach out to me and say, <clears throat> both you know both either magazines will come looking for somebody with my skill set or people that have read the kind of stuff I like to write will come to me and said, you know, we just found the shipwreck off of Montauk Point. Do you think that's a story for Newsday? Because they see you do those things. And the next thing I know, I have a LA Life cover that pays $800 because this story dropped into my lap. And, you know, the editor, I have the connections with Newsday and I have connections with the scuba diving and the historical community. Yeah, you know, the more you're out there doing things, you know, the easier it is to make it make it work. That makes sense. And it's a little bit of a vicious cycle because the more I'm not out there pitching and the, the more I'm sort of staying within the business community, yeah. then well, the, the, the less, the fewer ideas that I'm generating. Although sometimes I do have business ideas, but I sort of have this thing, I don't know, maybe I'm not confident enough about them or, well, this was covered here at this angle. Should I pitch this other angle? I'm not sure. You know, that kind of, a lot of doubt because I don't have the people in the industry that I can bounce ideas off of. 
Yeah, well, the other thing is, if, you know, if you're, you can turn your back, if you have a back, business background, you may want to pitch, you know, come up with business story ideas. Um, you know, Newsday, Newsday is hard to crack. They, 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 they're looking for a lot of experience from freelancers or uh, mm -hmm. you know, somebody like me that was a staff writer. But I mean, there's other opportunities like Long Island Business News and Weeklies that, that would do, uh, you know, business kind of stories. I mean, what, what kind of, have you done any non-business writing at all yet? I write for a magazine called Inner Vision currently. They do, it's, it's all about altruism and nonprofit kind of human interest special stories. So those have been fun. I've written for the Hop Hog Reporter. I wrote for a hospitality industry trade journal called Hotel Interactive, now Hotel Business. Yeah, well, I mean, if, I mean, if you have some experience, I mean, you could uh, try pitching business stories. The and it, but yeah, in terms of non-business, uh, it could it could just be it, it's human interest a lot of times with Intervision, or I was writing for uh, back bef when L and M Publications before they got bought out. I wrote quite mm -hmm. a few stories for them, doing talking about because uh, I was working in their office at the time, and then afterwards I freelanced as well. So those were all different stories: politics, human interest. Not so much hard news, although I did a little bit of that. Yeah, because I mean, there, you know, it, 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 there, there are like weekly newspapers is a good place to start. Uh, there's uh, community websites, there's Patch and things like that. I'm, I'm not, I think, I'm not sure they do any take freelance, but. Uh, yeah, Patch you know, has, I, Patch has uh, shrunk in many ways. Yeah, I know, there's a few, but there's a few sites that are still like Oyster Bay, they have one that's still fairly active. But you know the tr the tricky with freelancing, um, and the business work pays more, so it's kind of a, a tricky. Yeah. Like I'm trying to figure out what the path is because I mean there was a period of time where they were pay the the local papers were paying like fifty dollars an article, and it was like I can't justify. Yeah, well, that, doing that's this too often. Yeah, well, that's the kind of thing you do, you know, to get your, to get in, you know, to break in kind of thing. Um, and you don't want to do it for long, but you know, if, if you're trying to get more straight kind of news experience and you don't have a lot, you, you may have to do that. Uh, I would, you know, I wouldn't recommend doing it for free, but, uh, but the, the real thing is you got to come up with the ideas. I mean, my, yeah. I was not, I was not the best, I was not the best writer at Newsday by any means, but I was the best story generator at Newsday. I came up with so many ideas that like when the summer intern pr program was going, I, I would come up with enough ideas to keep all the summer, you know, five or six summer interns busy uh, the whole summer. Right. Um, so, so, and it's the same thing with magazines. I'm, you know, I'm pitching stories all the time and stuff just pops into my head. Um, and even with books that I do, it's because to me, it was always obvious that somebody should do a real, uh, like a full history of Sagamore Hill, but nobody ever did it. So I did it. You know, nobody had ever done a full maritime history of Long Island. So I did it. Um, and, and some of them came to me and my, my book on the Fire Island Lighthouse, the Lighthouse Preservation Group wanted a history and they said, well, you've done a lot of stories about us and we know you're a maritime historian, so why don't you write a history for us? So I did. Uh, so what I'd say is you got to come up with some good ideas. Um, you can bounce them off. You, you have my contact info? I do. Okay. So you can always bounce an idea off me and I can help you try to figure out where it might, you know, a market for it. Um, you know, I think we're probably going to get back doing live press club stuff in the fall. So, you, you know, you could come to meetings again, probably in the new news day and, uh, you know, meet people and, and talk to them. But I would, you know, I would definitely, I, I would join SPJ for a lot, both for the press club also. And you can, you can connect to Hillary and her committee. Um, you know, and there's, there's a lot of like freelancing, um, you know, sort of groups floating out there. But, that's, you know, that's and, 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 you know people, people in, in anybody in SPJ is usually pretty inclined to help other people, you know, get, get ahead of what they're doing. That's good to know. I guess it's just a question of meeting people and, you know, that way. I mean, maybe someone like you doesn't need that, but maybe other reporters might need yeah. somebody to bounce ideas off of too. Sometimes. Yeah, it's just, you know, it's just nice to have people to just to socialize, you know, and we, we yeah. do that too with the press club once. COVID is out of the way. And, you know, we actually did like a social Christmas holiday party, uh, just love to get people on, on the Zoom call so they can talk to each other and see, oh, okay. see what's on their mind. But, yeah, uh, I think I had a conflict. 
I'm trying to remember why I didn't. I know well some of the some of the panelists, uh, some of the panels weren't so relevant to me, and I didn't didn't sound like they were social. But I think the holiday thing, I think I had a conflict. I didn't find yeah. out about it until late. Yeah, but I mean, it, I think SPJ membership is 75 a year now. But if you can afford that, I think it would be a good investment. Uh, it also looks good on your resume, you know, because if you're writing, applying to an editor or trying to do an article for an editor, um, if they're if they're involved in SPJ, then they see that on your resume. I mean, I always, when I'm working with students or you know, people, when I see SPJ on their resume, it's like, okay, you know, I've put in okay. 40, 40 years of activity in SPJ. So when I see somebody in that organization, I, I sort of, you know, put a little gold star on their rep, on their, on what they're trying to pitch me. That's interesting. If you're, if you're saying that there, you don't need credentials to join SPJ, but it's still. Well, they're, they're, I mean, it's, it's basically, um, you could, if you're a freelance journalist or you want to become, that's all you need. I mean, that, that would be sufficient. You just go online and fill out the application. Okay, maybe it was ASJA that needed the credentials then. Yeah, I mean, the you, you have to be doing journalism or trying to get into journalism, but uh, I, don't, I don't think you would, have, you know, in your case, you'd have a problem. It's, you know, it's not that restrictive. Oh, okay. Because I had looked at something else and I, th I guess I might have confused organizations or because I thought I didn't have the, because they asked, they said you have to be working for a media outlet. No, because I mean, the SPJ has it has journalism students. I mean, in your case, just put down your freelance journalist, you know, because I mean, that, oh, that that would be sufficient. Oh, okay, gotcha. Yeah, but I, I can't imagine. I can't see any reason why you wouldn't be able to join SPJ. Oh, okay. Well, that's good to know. And and you you th you feel like uh, they will have other opportunities for networking and socialization. Yeah, well, I mean, you, 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 through us, through the press club as your local chapter, you'd have networking and social gatherings and, and, you know, professional development programs. Um, it, and, um, and there's a lot, I mean, it depends if you, if you travel, like there's also a New York City, you know, the Deadline Club in New York City does mm -hmm. a lot of programming, you know, you're not limited to, just to Long Island, but they have national conventions, they have these regional conferences, there's a magazine. Gotcha. Um, but in your case, uh, you know, connecting to Hillary and her, and her freelance committee, I think would be a real big asset. Oh, okay. Well, thanks. I, I appreciate that. I didn't know there was a committee. I wonder if they ever hold any sort of virtual gatherings as well, so I can meet people from other areas of the region. Um, I'm not. I'm. I'm not sure what the what the freelance group if they do their own programming or what. But uh, uh, you, uh, it, it's you worth could an inquiry. I have Hillary's information from earlier. Yeah, I, I mean, you could you could certainly just follow up with her and say you're thinking of joining SPJ in the committee. What is what exactly is that? I don't, I think they call it a community, freelance community, but you can ask, yeah. ask what they do and, events. you know, what opportunities it might, it might provide. But, uh, you know, I've, Hillary's done a couple of programs like this. Uh, you know, I've done freelancing programs with Hillary at other, other conferences and she's a great resource. Well, I'm glad I stuck around to talk to you. Okay. I, I appreciate your help. Yeah. And if you have any follow-ups down the road, you feel free to reach out. I, and thanks for offering to to be kind of a sounding board for an idea. Yeah, no. Um, yeah, you, you have you have my phone number and my email, or I have your email. I don't believe I have your phone number because is that easier? For all you of with, that changed. Yeah, is is phone easier for you with the vision issues? Well, I mean, I can I can uh, do both, but it always helps to have a phone number because sometimes, especially if you're bouncing an idea, it, it you can yeah, describe right. something in two minutes what would take maybe, t you know, 10 emails to go back and forth. All right. Well, uh, let me give you my, I'll give you my number. You can always call me. It's 516-628-5500. Uh, uh -huh. I appreciate that. Is that your mobile? That's home. That's, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm usually, when I'm not running around for errands, I'm home because, you know, I write from home. Oh, okay. I'll make sure I keep that in mind that it's your home number yeah but it's, it's home you know it's everything just you, you can always call okay if, gotcha. if you don't get me you can always leave a message i'll get back to you oh okay you, you still listen to voicemails huh oh That's yeah good. yeah i'm semi-old-fashioned yeah some people don't no i i i, I always answer all, all my emails i listen to all my phone messages i like voicemails because i like to hear the human at the other end yeah i just um, it always offended me and still offends me, you know, if I reach out to an editor and they don't respond. Um, and, you know, a lot of Newsday people never called people back, but you know, people would call it story tips or questions or complaints. 
And I, I, was, I always thought that was rude and, and counterproductive because people might complain and then still give you a good story idea. So I always made a point of, of responding to every, everybody, you know, even if they were yelling at me. <laughs> um, I like but, that. Yeah, but feel free. But I, yeah, I would definitely talk to Hillary to follow that lead. All right, so I, I see um, a couple other people. Do the people that's still here have any questions or anything? Or they may just be on and gone for lunch too, of all I know. Okay, I think they just left their, uh, the, yeah, no, exactly. left it on for later. Well, I was wondering when, uh, I, I had, is, are we doing it, is it at three, 3.34? The next thing is 4.30. Oh, okay. Is this, it, it, you were talking about social, that's the social piece. Okay. That, that's a uh, sort of networking trivia contest and whatever it turns into. Yeah, so I'm, I'll make sure I'm back for that. No, yeah, so you have, you have a, an hour and five minutes break to do whatever you'd like. I'll get some work done in the meantime. All right. Well, good luck with your endeavors, Elise. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Okay. If, you know, like, don't, don't hesitate to follow up if I can help you with something. Thanks. Take care, Bill. See you later. Okay. Okay, so long. <clears throat>